Hi everyone and welcome to this tutorial. I'm delighted to be here at ICCV 2021 and today I'm going to be talking about a topic that I think about a lot which is the role of modern model design and in particular how we can use model design to both characterize bias and to improve how we understand and develop trustworthy AI models. Um, and to start, perhaps a little bit about me. So I'm a research scientist at Google Brain, and my research agenda to date has focused on how do we go beyond test set accuracy? So how do we train performance of models to fulfill multiple criteria? So not just high performance in terms of top line metrics, but compact, so able to deploy in resource constrained environments, fair, interpretable, robust. And uh, in many ways, what I'll be talking about today is the interactions between these criteria and how often understanding these interactions can pave the way for a more sustainable approach to mitigating model bias. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be talking about three things. I'm going to be providing some insight into why we train models with imperfect objectives that don't capture all the desirable properties that we want. But then I'm going to be talking a little bit about the challenges in building response by AI algorithms, but also how recognizing these trade-offs can open up new directions of model-based mitigation. And a lot of what I'll talk about is work done with colleagues, um, uh, and uh, which I've listed here. Um, but to begin with, let's talk about the imperfect objective. So take a look at this image. What do you see? Um, and perhaps take a look at each one. Uh, and uh, maybe after you've looked at it for a little while, you may notice that these are slightly unusual versions of familiar objects. So it's a chair, which doesn't quite look comfortable to sit on. Uh, it's a fork, which would be hard to pick up. Um, these are actually a series of objects by an artist called the Uncomfortable, and they're designed to be very uncomfortable for humans to use. And what's interesting is that um, Perhaps the question that we care about a lot when we think about responsible AI is, what if discomfort is not uniform, but it's instead targeted? What do you notice about these two pictures? Anything out of ordinary? So these pictures are two examples of hostile architecture. So they're designed to prevent people from lingering too much in one space. So the benches are designed to prevent you lying down, to spend too long, and the studs and the cement are also prevent, to prevent you from sitting down. And these would disproportionately uh, affect uh, people who don't have another place to go, so who use public spaces for long periods of time. And often um, when we design uh, when we design technology and we try and bridge the technology gap, we, our goal is to avoid this type of uh, disparate impact and to develop technology that works for everyone. But achieving this requires understanding how our modeling choices impact downstream impact. And uh, in many ways, this has been complicated by the fact that over the last few decades, performance of the model has been treated as synonymous with the pursuit of top one accuracy. This is in part because uh, our models for a very long time were not particularly good. So it was quite exciting to achieve more and more breakthroughs just in terms of top line performance. But it's also because uh, in, in many ways, we haven't really had a rich discussion around how this metric is insufficient. Uh, so test and accuracy does not guarantee that the train function fulfills other properties that we may care about. So we may have different formulations of loss, but we rarely codify in that loss uh, the properties that we would like our model to achieve beyond just uh, test set performance. Um, and uh, these typical loss functions like MSE, hinge loss, cross entropy, impose no preference of functions that are interpretable, fair, robust, or guarantee privacy. And in many ways, we shouldn't be surprised uh, when we train models with objectives that don't contain these criteria and they end up not fulfilling them. Uh, Donald New said, and I like this quote a lot, that computers do exactly what they're told, no more, no less. Uh, what I take away from this is really this idea that a model can fulfill an objective in many ways while violating the spirit of said objective. Um, I want to talk about this idea of learning uh, 
a high accuracy without true learning by also bringing an example of Clever Hands. So Clever Hands was a rather famous horse in Berlin uh, between 1891 and 1907. And Clever Hands was famous because uh, Clever Hands uh, was remarkably good at solving arithmetic functions, identifying colors, counting the crowds, so it became a rather important attraction. And the longevity of the fame existed because no one could understand why Clever Hands was so good. Um, and it took a, a dedicated commission to actually isolate how Clever Hands did this. So it, the Clever Hands was a great example of high accuracy without true learning because it was the design of the experiment was such that the Clever Hands only did not get the answer right when the person asking the question did not know the answer. And uh, this was used to deduce that, in fact, Hands was answering correctly by picking up on microscopic facial clues from those that asked the question. Um, so, in fact, this happens quite often in, in machine learning. We have a high accuracy without true learning. And this is because the underspecification of objective function often leads to undesirable model behavior that is often called shortcut learning. So in front of you, you see two images of a cow. Which image do you think the model gets right and which one does it get wrong? So perhaps you said the one on the right. And you would be right. <laughs> and the, this is, uh, you can deduce that this is because it's rather rare to have an image of a cow on the beach. And so it's an infrequent, rare example in most training. Um, and thus the model doesn't learn to recognize it. Um, what about the one on the left, this limousine? So uh, we have the left and, and the right. Which one? So if you chose right, you're again right. And this is because the model, again, has learned to correlate the more dominant pattern of limousines in urban environments versus limousines in ice. And so it's thrown when it's presented with a limousine on ice. And uh, we see this in countless cases. So this is a great example. This was an API that was released publicly. And uh, you, it's a captioning API, so it captions images. And on the image on the left, uh, it captions this image, a herd of sheep grazing on a lush green hillside. <laughs> but there's no sheep to be seen. And it's because perhaps the correlation of images it's seen of sheep have always been on these very luscious backgrounds. Um, and then we have this picture of a child holding an animal, which is actually a lamb, but it's captioned dog. And again, we can uh, infer that perhaps the training corpus had many, whenever a child was holding an animal, it's more likely to be a dog. Um, so this is perhaps funny or uh, odd, or we can laugh at it, but when it happens in sensitive domains, it can be a huge cost to human welfare. So two examples here. One is skin lesions. And in this case, uh, there was the use of a ruler um, used to photograph one type of malignant tumor. And the model learned to associate the presence of the ruler with the condition. Um, in the second work, uh, it was the presence of a metal tag, which one hospital in particular had uh, would place on patients. And the model learned to associate this with the over-indexing of cases from this hospital. And in both these cases, are not generalizable patterns, because when we release the model into the real world, there will be no rulers and no metal tags. And so we have to understand how we can prevent these type of generalization failures, where a model achieves high accuracy on uh, the test set, but doesn't generalize beyond in a real world environment. So shortcut learning, as, uh, uh, as I presented it, is really due to this relative over under representation of training features. Um, so a model may learn to correlate blonde with being a female, because it's far males in a training data set, for example. It results in higher rate, uh, error rates on the long term, the underrepresented features on the data. So how a model treats these underrepresented features often coincides with notions of fairness. For example, um, in work on gender shades, uh, the authors showed that facial recognition APIs, which are commonly used, had far higher error rates on um, black women in particular relative to other subgroups. Um, work on geographic bias and how we collect data sets shows that models perform far worse on locales that are undersampled in the training set. And uh, there's work which also shows that this uh, can propagate uh, undesirable spurious correlations in how we treat things like gender um, or stereotypes about gender. So this paper has a fantastic title, Men Also Like Shopping <laughs> and Cooking Too. 
Um, and it shows this over indexing on a dominant pattern and propagating that forward so we can scale the biases in our data set by not paying attention to this. So how do we mitigate this undesirable model behavior? Firstly, let's talk about what we mean by fairness. So this really encapsulates preferences about how our trade model should behave on a subset of sensitive or protected features. And there are legally protected features, so certain attributes are protected by law. Uh, in the US, it's illegal to discriminate based upon race, color, religion, sex, national origin. But this is very fluid and differs by country. Um, in many cultures, the notion of protected attribute may be different. It may be something like caste, or maybe something like tribe, um, or even the speaking of a different language. Um, and when we talk about protected features, we also have to be this is very correlated with what we call proxy features or sensitive features. So for example, income, eye color, skin color, accent, locale can be very related and uh, implicitly capture the protected feature. So even though they're not protected by law, they are often correlated with protected attributes. So our choice of tool to mitigate and uh, audit these algorithmic biases will depend to a large extent on whether we know, firstly, the sensitive features which are adversely impacted, and secondly, and this is something I really want to talk about, the assumption that there's comprehensive labels for these features. So on the one end, if we have a known concern, we know a priori what we're concerned with, and we have comprehensive labels, there's a large body of work which kind of guides how we, we should both audit and mitigate. So we can track impact using intersectional metrics. So we can use um, metrics like accuracy, false negative, rate, false positive rate. Um, and this requires good balanced test sets that are representative of the actual use cases for the model and production. An example of this type of intersectional order would be something like gender shades, which evaluate and classifies performance across gender, skin types, intersectional gender and skin type. Um, and when these labels are known and complete, it opens up a range of remedies to mitigate impact. So we can rebalance, we can reweight, we can remove problematic feature from the training set, although this is not always feasible. For example, if you think about an image, removing an attribute is more complex because what does it mean to remove pixels from an image? Um, and in fact, by removing, we may end up perturbing the distribution in unexpected ways. But with enough labels, this is definitely a more feasible path. It also opens up model-based mitigation strategies. So uh, changing the optimization function so that we uh, avoid disparate Im impact on certain labeled subgroups, uh, rate constraints, for example. But the case I really wanna talk about today is perhaps a more realistic case. So what about where we don't have complete labels for the sensitive attribute we care about? And uh, this is more realistic because um, Despite the emphasis on situations where we do have comprehensive labels, for example, can you spot a metric on this list which doesn't require labels? Um, and this is a list of very typical guidance for practitioners um, about how they should audit their data. But you'll see that most of our remedies are centered around this assumption that we do have comprehensive labels. And I would argue this is a tenuous assumption. More often than not, we do not have comprehensive labels from human annotators. This is very typical for high dimensional problems that we see in computer vision. And oftentimes uh, it's, it's time consuming or uh, expensive, infeasibly expensive to comprehensively label. Uh, for example, uh, if a high dimensional problems, you may have an image like this. This is something, an image I, I took while I was in Portugal in 2019. It feels like a lifetime ago now. But uh, I was in Portugal, I took an image of a church. And perhaps the, the, the top label you would annotate is church. But you could easily add many different labels, like bird, nest, street, cross, statue, window, window grid. And perhaps these labels are correlated with each other. Um, this brings me to the second point that's difficult, which is that labeling just protected features is insufficient. We also need to label all the proxy -like features. So consider this task. So we have this set of animal images and we're trying to predict sleeping or awake. Um, and so if we consider species to be the protected attributes, so we have little kitty cats and we have lion cubs here. Um, in fact, we can actually not use this feature or try to remove it in, in many different ways. But there may be other variables which are proxy variables. For example, you'll notice all the images of the lion cubs are outside and all the pictures of the cats are inside. 
And so we would also have to label all those proxy features to make sure that they weren't being leveraged by the model. Um, there's also legal obstacles around collecting certain sensitive features. It's often cumbersome. There's a, a reporting bias in how these are collected. I actually want to point out this Facebook release of data set, which I think is notable for actually getting uh, full consent from all the people who participated and compensating. But I think that's an anomaly. And often the way that this is done and uh, our publicly available data sets that are curated for protective features are very limited. Um, and there's inconsistency in how sensitive features are labeled. So this is a great example of how even the notion of what is black, Asian, white, and South Asian can have high levels of both agreement among annotators, but high levels of disagreement. Um, and so how we do this across many different data sets may be inconsistent. If we cannot guarantee that we fully address bias in the data pipeline or that we fully audited it, the overall harm in the system is a product of the interactions between the data and our model design choices. And part of what I'd like to share in this tutorial is this idea that even on the, on the model design side, we have the chance to both minimize harm as well as by acknowledging the role that model design has, provide insight into what we can audit. There's unsupervised protocols we can use to audit harm. Um, and this is really important because recognizing how model design impacts harm opens up new te mitigation techniques that are far less burdensome than comprehensive data collection, which for the reasons we just mentioned may often be infeasible. Uh, and this is what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to talk about four different ideas, um, but all relate to this idea of how do we use model design to characterize bias in developing trustworthy AI, AI models. So the first one is how do we leverage model signal for cheap annotations? So the biggest challenges in improving data sets is identifying where to invest limited human annotation time. And this, if, this is compounded by the growth in data set size. And here the challenge is how do we surface a tractable subset of the most challenging uh, and the least challenging examples for human inspection? This kind of directs limited data annotation time. It helps with data cleaning, isolating a subset for relabeling, but also helps with auditing because another key assumption that we make when we have comprehensive labels is that we already know what we're looking for. We kind of assume that someone already knows what the protected attribute is, that it's present in the data set, that it's comprehensively labeled. But there may be other types of bias that are not so clear cut where we actually need to be able to inspect the data in order to have an informed opinion about what we should be tracking over time. So this will help with that too. So I want to really talk about global feature important ranking, ranking tools, which are cheap tools that can use to rank data set examples by which are most challenging. And in particular, I'm going to talk about two recent works that I was involved with. So one is uh, really a tool to score images by difficulty. And this is uh, we term it variance of gradients. And what we do is we are looking at the variance in, in gradients for an image over training and leveraging time itself as a signal about what images are being learned by the model. So the, the variance is growing, uh, is, is smaller over time because you have this convergence in gradients, which make it a more narrow, more narrow range and difference. And some examples which are very difficult, so they keep on being bounced around the decision boundary and you have high variance in the input gradients. And so by doing this, by computing the variance of these input gradients, we end up with a relative ranking um, of each image according to the class. And this really helps us understand what does the model find challenging or easy to learn. And you can see here from these examples, there's distinct semantic properties to this. So for example, for low VOG, we have these kind of uncluttered, um, nicely centered images uh, with typically a very clear background and the object is very clearly defined within the image. And then high VOG, you see perhaps much more clutter. So perhaps it's um, hard to decipher what the image is or maybe the pose is a little unusual. Um, and what's important about this is that we want a, a method that effectively discriminates between easy and challenging classes because we want a human annotator to be able to select the percentile they want to use and direct limited annotation time. And we see the VOG does this. So what you're looking at is on the x-axis, you have the percentile, the VOG score, and then you're mapping the error for each percentile. Um, so what we've seen is that high VOG scores correspond to examples with higher test set error. Um, 
And uh, another thing that I want to briefly talk about is that it's really important to understand that this is actually a richer research direction, understanding how feature importance forms over the course of training. It's a rich source of interpretability because what we see and what recent work shows is there's distinct stages of training. So, um, and what we see with VOG as well is that easy examples are learned early on and harder examples require memorization for most of training. So uh, we have this crystallization of frequent features in very early stages, and the rest of training is memorization of rare features. Um, and this is important because it also allows us to think more about adaptive training. So leveraging early signal to change how we use model capacity and spend more time on more difficult examples. So I've just talked about one strategy for dealing with a limited annotated data regime. So that's leveraging model signal to identify the best candidates for additional human annotation. I wanna talk about a second strategy briefly, which is that we also wanna invest in small, highly curated probes that differ in known ways of the training distribution. So how do we design these? Probes. And this is a general area of how do we stress test our models. And it's a good strategy when you have very, when annotation is very expensive, you spend time annotating a very clearly defined stress test or defining it very precisely so that you at least have some mechanism to probe model behavior. And what this is, is it is a non-statistical test to gain a relative understanding of how model performance changes. And it should involve a clear understanding of the distribution shift that's being modeled. So it, that's what it is. What it is not is meant to capture all possible failure modes or meant to be a precise measure of model performance once deployed. Um, and with these caveats in mind, I would like to talk about how the, the academic benchmarks have approached this, but also how I think practitioners should approach it in general. So uh, academically, we have various academic benchmarks for robustness testing. So I'll briefly mention ImageNet A and ImageNet C, but there's now uh, uh, a quickly growing zoo of different ImageNet letters. <laughs> um, and ImageNet A is this natural adversary examples. Um, and ImageNet C is applying to corruption. So you can see what the commonalities are. They're modeling very specific types of distribution shift. In the case of ImageNet A, it's um, the difficulty of the example that's being varied. So it's testing model performance and perhaps examples that have already been pre-identified as particularly challenging. And ImageNet C is applying uh, corruptions where for a human, we can still identify the image. And it's asking, given this corruption, does the model still identify? Um, there's also things like the WILD benchmark, uh, which is testing very, very specific types of distribution shift. Um, and what I think is important is that the best stress tests will also leverage domain knowledge. So um, here, as practitioners, setting aside subsets of the data not to be included during training, the different known ways from the training set distribution is very important. And some suggestions of how to do this could be from a time range the training data set range from a different geography than the training set data set locale or from users who use a different device. And this is a valuable way to audit for algorithmic bias when you only have labels for a limited data set with a sensitive feature you want to track. So maybe you don't have comprehensive labels, so you can't use it as a mitigation constraint on your model training. But if you do have a limited subset where you've invested in curating, the, the data set labels, then that can open up pathways for at least measuring over time how your model is doing on that subset. And again, it's a way to deal with a limited data regime. So now I wanna turn to really um, uh, the role that our model design choices can have an amplifying bias or curbing bias. So we've already seen how we can leverage model signal to identify examples that um, we, we either care about because we want to look at them more challenging. Now I want to look at the impact of model design choices on bias itself. Um, and this is a recent piece that I wrote about, which is how do we move beyond algorithmic bias as a data problem and acknowledge that it's a system problem. So we have bias in our data set and our choices about how we design our models can actually inform how this is amplified or curved. Um, and the common misconception that models are impartial and merely reflect biases in the data set is um, surprisingly widespread. <laughs> um, and what I would like to impart today is that uh, this is simply not the case. In the absence of intentional interventions, the trained model can and does amplify undesirable biases in the training data set. And if we pause to think about it, this is in fact one of the first lessons that we learn in machine learning. So in an introduction to machine learning class, you're also you're often presented with a linear po polynomial function like this. 
And you're shown that as you increase the degree of the polynomial, uh, you end up with this uh, increasingly overfit curve. Um, and uh, what this is, is a design choice that expresses a preference for final model behavior. And as we increase the degree of the polynomial, we end up with something which is overfit to the training, but doesn't generalize as well. And there's a sweet spot where it reflects behavior that we want. The only difficulty is that we've been predominantly thinking about this in terms of test set performance, but not in terms of the other properties that we care about. And I think that this is also a fault in how even within the trustworthy ML literature, we often make the unrealistic assumption that optimizing for one property holds all other statics. So often when we talk about fairness, we talk about in terms of overall performance. Same for model compression. We may only talk about compression in terms of test set accuracy. And the same for robustness. But we actually need a more rich uh, uh, discourse about how these objectives interact with each other. Because optimizing for one objective may entail trade-offs with each other. And to convey that, I want to actually talk about a case study. Uh, so work that we've done that asks how model compression can trade off against other properties, such as robustness and fairness. So I'll be talking about two works. And in these work, we really look at this question of what are all these parameters being used for? So to introduce and to motivate it, um, I think it's important to recognize that we're currently part of a bigger is better race in the number of parameters. And that's largely because uh, the very popular recipe of throwing parameters at a problem has been motivated by observing it has better <laughs> top line performance. But there's several peculiar aspects about why do we need all these weights in the first place. So one is that there's diminishing returns to adding parameters. So we need millions of parameters to eke out additional gains. For example, we can almost double the amount of weights for only a two percentage point gain in accuracy if we compare inception v3 and inception v4. So you observe that we almost we go from 21 million to 40 million, doubling the weights, but we only see a two percent test set accuracy gain. And the question becomes: If what are what are all these parameters being used for? There's also many redundancies between weights. So it's been shown that you can use a small holdout to predict 95% of the weights in a network. And um, there's, of course, the puzzling ability that we can remove most of these weights after training. So with minimal loss to test that accuracy. So this is work that we did, which showed that even if you remove it random, you can remove 90% of weights with very low degradation in, in performance. And if you remove with a slightly more sophisticated method, so just by thresholding values, you only lose 3% of performance. So this holds across both computer vision and NLP domains. Um, so it, it's very interesting because uh, even in um, NLP, very simple methods can be used to remove the majority of weights with very little impact on top line metrics. So the question we started with is how can these networks with radically different structures and number of parameters have comparable performance? And one possibility is that test and accuracy is not a precise enough measure to capture how pruning impacts the generalization properties of the model. So in these works, we did go beyond test and accuracy. And we asked, how does the model behavior diverge as we vary the level of compression, both to robustness and to measure divergence in class level and exemplar level of performance? And this is actually a very powerful experimental framework for the following reason, is that firstly, um, sparse models, uh, you have a degree of precision. So you can train populations of models to very precise end level of sparsity. So we can radically vary the structure with a lot of control. The second is that um, sparse models outperform by a lot dense models of the same parameter count. So if you compare a small dense model to a small sparse model with the same known parameters, sparse models easily outcompete. So when we're comparing these sparse models, we're actually comparing models which are in a similar top line metric regime. There's very low degradation, as I, as I showed. So that's a far more interesting, because we're not comparing a bad model to a good model. We're comparing good models which re reach comparable top line metrics. And then we're asking what differs in generalization behavior. And what we mean when we say sparsity of 90%, it means by the end of training, the model only has 10% of weights remaining. So we apply a mask of zero to the remaining weights. Um, and as I mentioned, this is a powerful way to explore this idea of how structure and capacity impacts generalization performance. So to tell you the results up front, we show that these top level metrics hide critical differences in generalization between compressed and non-compressed models. So compressed models have amplified sensitivity to adversary examples and common corruptions. Um, also, varying capacity disproportionately and systematically impacts our small subset of the data. 
But what I want to get to in this talk is why is a narrow quasar data distribution far more sensitive to variant capacity? Because I think that's really of interest when we think about how model design choices can amplify or curb harm. So we do find that what happens is a compressed model cannibalizes performance from a small subset of classes to preserve and sometimes even improve relative performance on others. But when we ask what makes the certain parts of the distribution far more sensitive, we can look at what we call these pruning identified exemplars. So these are images where the predictive behavior diverges between a population of independently trained compressed and non-compressed models. So take a look at this image. What do you think the true label is? This is from the ImageNet test then. So this is actually a toilet seat. And I've included here an example of a non-pie toilet seat and a pie toilet seat. What about this image? What do you think the true label is? So this is an espresso, although many have suggested it looks like Guinness in a wine glass. Um, and there's a non-pie and pie here. And here, uh, maize. Uh, and this one is actually wool as a true label. Um, and here we see matched. So what you've gathered is that these are actually just more challenging images for humans and algorithms to classify. So when we compress, what's disproportionately impacted are the examples which are already very challenging for the model. So here we plot the top one accuracy of a non-compressed model on pi on the entire test set and on non-pi. And we show that the performance is far lower on pi. Um, and even for ImageNet, removing pi from the test set improves the top one accuracy of um, the non-compressed model. So uh, we also find that compression amplifies algorithmic harm when the protection features in the long tail of the distribution. So what pruning is actually doing, it's removing performance on rare features. So most of the model, most of the weights in your network, 90% of the weights are being used to learn a reasonable representation for rare and underrepresented features. And we remove those weights, we preserve performance on the common features and we degrade performance disproportionately on the long tail. Um, and uh, to understand this, let's look at the impact of compression specifically when a protected attribute is underrepresented. So here we show with far fewer examples of blonde male and blonde old in the training set um, that these are disproportionately impacted when we prune. So these are, uh, are cannibalized essentially. Um, and we replicate the same on civil comments. So this is the task of detecting civil comments. Um, and here we show again a sharp degradation and balanced accuracy for many of the different protected ability to detect toxic comments for different um, protected attributes like race, gender, and religion. So compression is not the only design choice that can amplify bias. So work has also shown that, um, that differential privacy and objectives that trade for differential privacy is proportionally impact on represented attributes. And this is because Steps like gradient clipping or noise injection are disproportionately impacting outlier examples. Um, and what this means is that the design choices that we make really matter. And there's a trade-off between things like compression and fairness, privacy and fairness, um, robustness and fairness. And we have to be cognizant of this when we, uh, particularly when we deploy to sensitive domains. So what is the way forward? Here's some parting thoughts um, before uh, we open up uh, this tutorial and I'm looking forward to seeing everyone on the panel later. So Alan Blackwell said in 1997 that in computer science, many sub goals can be deferred to the degree that they become what is known amongst professional programmers as somebody else's problem. And I think that the belief that algorithmic bias is only a data set problem invites this uh, diffusion of responsibility. This idea that this is someone else's problem, it doesn't belong to people who design algorithms. But this also misses important opportunities to curb harm and to design techniques uh, that actually improve these trade-offs. So deploying an algorithm involves many different steps. We've talked about some of them today, data collection, data labeling, training using some specified objective, um, deployment and the interaction of the algorithm with, uh, the, with the deployment environment and how that informs the data that's collected itself to retrain the model. However, the ma machine learning research community has disproportionately published around one step, which is training. <laughs> how do we use objectives and metrics in an open source curated data set 
So we typically abstract away data collection and we abstract away deployment. But this surprisingly uh, widely held belief that models are impartial displaces responsibility for bias to those responsible for the data pipeline. If bias is fully not fully pipeline, harm is a product of both data and design choices. Model design choices can and do amplify harm. Um, and the truth is, most of the time we can't fully address bias in the data pipeline because it's typically very hard to ensure that we've comprehensively labeled all the data. And a priori, we know um, all the different biases we have to be cognizant of. This is compounded by the fact that we have ever-growing data sets. And so realistically, we have to think about all the aspects of our system that can curb harm and all the intervention points where we can both audit and also intervene to improve our trade-offs. So understanding the interactions between modern data set, I believe strongly can open up new mitigation strategies for designing models that are better specified. And um, I've talked about two main ways. I think that one is this idea that we can leverage model signal to direct human time better to think about what examples we need annotation for, and also to think about adaptive learning strategies where we spend more time on certain examples than others. The fact that most of our capacity is being used to encode a representation for a small fraction of the data set tells me our capacity is not being used correctly. Uh, the fact that most of training is used for memorization, but early examples are learned very early on, um, and then we're spending most of our training on a very small fraction, also tells me that we're not, um, we're leveraging a very inefficient training process. And we can think about revisit our protocol and leverage signal to really allocate resources better. Um, this is a quote that I like. Lord Kelvin reflects that if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. So acknowledging that model design matters has the benefit of spurring more research focus on how it matters and will inevitably surface new insights into how we design models to minimize harm. I've actually included some data work that has come out since we first did this comprehensive order of com compression and fairness trade-offs that already has proposed new ways to design methods that better, achieve better or preferable trade-offs in terms of robustness and fairness. Um, and I think that's a key, uh, key component of progress is that we have to articulate the, the benchmark of progress in order to um, attract the, the relevant resources for it. So understanding our risk profile of different design choices helps spur progress. It helps us allocate resources. So practitioners should prioritize additional time for audits and models that are compressed or trained to be differentially private, because we know that these models are higher risk. But it also guides the development of new techniques. So we've already seen work which uh, really uh, minimizes amplification of bias so in the sensitivity to adversary examples. So I'm going to close there. It has been such a pleasure. It's been wonderful uh, sharing some of these questions as part of this tutorial. But uh, please do reach out. I've included my email here, and I'll be at the panel later today. So. Um, thank you again to the organizers of ICCV um, and looking forward to continuing this discussion.